wonderful episode, Connection, the Heart of Early Childhood Podcast. I'm Katrina Gallegos, and I'm here with my co-host, Terry Tapia. Hi, Katrina. So excited to be back again this time. Me too, Terry. I've just really enjoyed our conversations and being able to sit down and have further conversations around different topics and really connecting our listeners to things that are happening here in New Mexico. I agree. And I think one of the nice things about our guests is that we are able to tap into expertise from individuals or colleagues from around the whole United States. Yes, that is so true. So Terry, who do we have the pleasure of getting to sit down and have a deeper conversation with today? Well, you know, the topic is diving deeper into class for New Mexico part two. And a few weeks ago, we got to visit with Erin Sabina from Teachstone. And this time we get to visit with Monica Pujol Nassib. One of the great things about this part two is that we truly are digging deeper into class. Yes, and I just cannot wait just to hear all the information that she has around this tool and how we can really support educators and what can really happen when you utilize a tool as a data point in your coaching or just having those deeper conversations in practice-based coaching. So I cannot wait. So everyone pull up a seat and get ready to listen to this wonderful episode. Monica, we're so glad to have you with us today and our opportunity to dive deeper into class for New Mexico. So we have one question for you to start. What is your background and what led you to come and work for TeachStone? I became a Montessori teacher when back in the day, back in Costa Rica. And the reason I'm a Montessori guide is what we're called. When I went to observe classrooms, you know, before you graduate in the first year of school, I came back and I said, I don't think I can do this. Everybody's screaming, the teachers are screaming, everybody's upset. It was really hard for me to observe classrooms. And I don't want to go to a career when that's going to be my job. So a professor said, read this book. And it was the Montessori method. So I learned as much as I could about Montessori. And a couple of years later, they came to train Montessori guides in my country. So right there, I knew I had this auditory sensibility. Like it's things that are loud are very hard for me to be around. Also, in response to trying to care for this child who had these behaviors that I tried everything I could, and I couldn't understand how to help him. I didn't know what is it that he was trying to tell me. So I changed my master's to cognitive and behavioral disabilities. So it's like growing because of what I'm doing and it's in front of me and it's needed. I worked in an organization uh, leading programs. My teams were observing and coaching uh, educators. Um, we had inclusive classrooms, and I re- in this team, we were using the class tool, and this coach came to me, and she said, in this classroom, all the children had special needs, and I didn't know how to observe. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, every step is something different. Uh, I also manage parenting programs, and including children with disabilities. I did early intervention, and so things kept building up. In 2011, the QRIS protocol in Broward County, Florida was revised. I was with this team and class became a huge element of it. We had three and class was one of them. It it was a pilot at the time. Now it's statewide, but at the time it was pilot. So I became an observer of pre-K first and all my teams. And then we did TTTs. And then I was, uh, at the time it was called making the most of classroom interactions facilitator, which is class group coaching. So it kept growing. Like when I learned class, the first time I sat to listen about it and I was reading, I'm like, every teacher should know class. It's, it takes uh-huh. just the teachers. So I became passionate from day one. It aligned with my Montessori uh, background, with my personality. The research was telling me this is what works. So in 2018, I was lucky enough that teachers don't hire me. I've been with them since. Good. Monica, just a follow up for our audience Tell us where you are located right now. I live in Arizona. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I learned class back in Florida and I have moved since to Arizona. So Teachstone works with that. So I know many of of our other um, colleagues in Teachstone live in various parts of the, the country. And so that it allows for that too, doesn't it? In my job, after the pandemic is... Most of the company, before the pandemic, 50% of the people worked at the office and 50% like myself in my position, we traveled. So we have a home office and we were traveling. But now since the pandemic, 
everybody can work from home. So very little people are in the office and all of us, doesn't matter that position that we're hired to do can be anywhere in the States. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction to how you came to be part of Teachstone. You're welcome. So much experience that you've had that really built you up to this point where you are working at Teachstone now too. So Monica, can you tell us a little bit about the classroom assessment scoring system class and what does the class tool measure? So we measure moment to moment interactions of educators with children and children with children. When we observing, we're capturing all those behaviors, all the responses from children to educators, responses from educators to children, and how deep those interactions go, measured by the response from the children. So we're looking for three main elements. The first one is, is called emotional support, which is measuring what is the degree of enjoyment and warmth and trust are in that classroom, in that setting, through interactions. So research has told us when teachers are effective under the behaviors of emotional support, the brains of the children can move from being on alert to survive into the limbic system towards the frontal cortex so that they can learn. But this emotional support piece has to be in place. The second element is uh, called the domain of classroom organization. An organized classroom is an organized brain. Under classroom organization, we are measuring to which degree are the teachers promoting self-regulation, guiding self-regulation, redirecting behaviors that could be disruptive or dangerous. And in which way are they misbehaviors? We also measure how are the teachers using the time when the children are in the sentence with them? And how are they providing opportunities for the children to engage and to learn? And lastly, under this domain, we also measure the level of engagement. Know exactly what they are learning that comes from the next domain, but how are the educators engaging with the children? How are they um, facilitating different modalities and strategies so that the children can engage in the way that they like, tapping into their special abilities or talents or gifts? Do the children know what it is that they're working on? Why are they playing with that? Why are they making that activity? So are they thinking of the why? And lastly, these two domains, again, are preparing the brain so that they can learn. So in the last domain, we call uh, instructional support. We are measuring how the teachers are promoting cognitive and language skills through interactions, through back and forth exchanges, not only on social conversation, though it's necessary, of course, but through listening, through asking more questions, to pausing and listening to the answers or observing the answers or both, building on that, helping the children go to the next level of thinking through opportunities, guiding them, not giving them the answers, but allowing them to experiment and discover the world that you and I know. So that is in a big way what we are measuring with the class tool. The interactions, how teachers uh, have all these behaviors with the children and the educators and children with children. That is just so powerful, but really those true interactions by having those three domains and really focus in on those pieces and being able to have that person come in and observe you, giving you real feedback around those areas. I mean, that can really change practice. What a great thought out assessment scoring system. You know, as we're really diving in a little bit deeper here in New Mexico, it's just amazing just how it's kind of set up. Thank you for sharing that. And I just want to add, because you mentioned it, and that is one of the foundation of the class tool, which is teachers, educators are already doing these things. It's already happening. Beautiful things are already happening in the classrooms. So when we come and we measure, we capture all of that happening. And then on the coaching piece of it, on the professional piece of it, what do you want to work on? How do you want to get better at it? Thinking of three elements are key, which is the frequency of the interactions, the duration of the interactions, and the depth of the interactions. But they are doing it. You teachers are doing it. It's doing it intentionally. Woohoo! You guys are doing it. You heard it from Monica. <laughs> They're doing it. And it's just that piece of it where you can go into that depth and the duration of it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Monica, I loved the way you expressed that uh, when we are supporting the social emotional needs of young children, that is preparing the brain 
to learn. And that's so true. And we don't think about that, that if young children are anxious or in, not in that um, positive, enjoying frame of mind, as you said, that the atmosphere is one of enjoyment, the brain itself is not ready to learn. And so um, as we continue in our coaching in New Mexico, we, you know, we continue to say we're working on social emotional development and early literacy. Well, we can't get to early literacy if our young children are not in a good space in their social emotional uh, well-being. So thank you for that and the importance of how class measures that for us and our observations. As we move on and we think about class, we talked about the observing of class. So then how do we know that this that the class observation tool measures effective teaching. Tell us a little bit about that. That is an interesting question. Something the class does not do is measuring the curriculum or the content that is happening. That's part of the structure, which is super important, of course, in the educational setting. What we are measuring is those behaviors that are changing the life of children. And research is telling us that Class is impacting mostly teachers or educators who work with children at risk, who maybe these interactions only occur within the classrooms. That teacher, you teachers, could be the one person who is making the difference in the life of that person. So that is what we are measuring. So it's the quality of those interactions. It's how children respond to your interactions. So what we want is to make sure that the experience of each child, because each child is important that all the experiences are life-changing. Play language. We want you teachers to consistently talk with the children all the time. When you find yourself being quiet, speak with them. Narrate what's happening. Even if you feel like you're talking to yourself, that's okay. Just expose them to language so we can close the gap of the exposure to language children have had in, in different social economical status, according to research. So... How do we know measures effective teaching? Once we take that data and we analyze the data, and I used to do this in my programs, how are children developing? How are they progressing in their skills? So the better teachers get, the stronger skills children are gaining. When educators get strong at promoting safety in the classroom, they get to enjoy those interactions better, the teachers. But that also means because the children feel safe, their outcomes are stronger too. So it's a direct correlation of effective teaching, effective interactions with the outcomes of children. And I like the way that it's not so much the teaching of academic, maybe academic principles and concepts. We know those are important, but we can't get to that, right? Until all of the other pieces are in place that you uh, just described. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, Social emotional is just so critical. It's what you're saying in those interactions and, you know, our practices as teachers, we want to do better, get better at what we're doing, that growth mindset. And class is really the system that really can support us in doing that and having that data point to really focus on what we see is an area of need and really take that into coaching and build off of that. And this is just a great data point to be able to have. Monica, I have another question too, is what are some of the differences between general education and special education classrooms? And how are these different? And how does it relate to class? I love this question because special education being one of my strengths, my specialties, the way that teachers interact with children shouldn't be different. Every child deserves quality interactions. Every child and even if you don't have any child with special needs, every child brings something different. Every child has different abilities, different cultures, different interests, preferences, languages. No matter the setting, right? Monica, I have chills over here that <laughs> <as> you're talking. <laughs> I know. And so when we get to understand that, it's just fascinating because they're all children and we're all people. And I always say this, all of us have something that's special about us. I just said I am very sensitive in my hearing. It's just loud for me. That makes me special. All of us have something. And um, some children like to be jumping as they are learning. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. So in class, one of the main drivers is that we focus on the individualized interactions. So because this is already a given, it's part of what we do, is how our teachers 
supporting children who have any need, <laughs> special or however we call them, abilities, special abilities. I love uh, using that term because the point here is effective interactions are built on intentionality, meeting every child where they are, providing those levels of support to help them succeed, children with disabilities or not. We do want to be knowledgeable. If I go to observe a classroom that has children with disabilities, we want the observers to understand disabilities and strategies used with children with disabilities. But what we are looking is for that effectiveness of those interactions. Maybe children need more time to process. Maybe they need to be hiding in a box because it's too overwhelming. So what is the teacher doing with that? Is the teacher ignoring the child in the box? Or is the teacher making the child part of the interactions in an individualized way? It's okay. And how are the teachers, the educators, promoting relationships of children with that child who's in the box, respecting the fact that the child wants to be in the box and understanding why? So yes, we have special laws for children with disabilities, although it's not very defined, but all children are children. They all deserve the best, increase opportunities to, to learn and to be loved and so thinking of that, right, when we don't have a very clear definition of what are the services or I did early intervention and I really loved it and I learned so much. The spectrum is just so, it's infinite. It's everything in between. So it's good to have this diagnosis for the services, the extra services they can receive, right? So that educator in the classroom is trying all these strategies to include the, every child. And then we might have the speech pathologist coming to the classroom or we have the play therapist coming to the classroom. So those are added resources, obviously, that children benefit from because they're individualized, right? And every child matters. Every child counts. That is just so important. Like teaching special education or if you're teaching a general education class, it doesn't matter. You can have a class assessment scoring system on your classroom where you can have someone come in and observe you. What a great data point for all teachers to be able to have so that they can really focus in on areas that they want to maybe grow in, like we've talked about, or areas they're doing really well in to be able to see that. I want to share this personal experience because it was amazing to me. Of course, I've learned theory, going to school and reading and listening to audiobooks. I love doing all of that. <laughs> but the children are the one they taught me reality. And every time, I, even now when I observe, but this specific child I'm thinking of, she was part of a parenting program and she had a cerebral palsy and she was completely strapped to a wheelchair. So she will come, either she will come to the events in my agency or the parent educators will go to the home. And I, I love being on the field. So I will come with them or I will go. <laughs> and she had a twin. So both of them were in the program. The child in the wheelchair and I were friends. She couldn't move. She was completely strapped, the head, the neck, the arm, every, everywhere. But oh my gosh, we knew each other. She knew I was there, that she was coming to me and uh, we could talk. She couldn't talk verbally, but you could tell like, how she will move her body, like a little bit, like a little bit of movement. She couldn't smile. She couldn't turn her head, but you can see the effort on the neck to try to move and try to smile. Like I tell her, I want to cry. She, with all those limitations, those physical limitations, she still, and this is pre-class. So that's why I say, teachers, you are doing it. We had a relationship. We, we communicated. We celebrated being with one another. She was asked things and she was given the opportunity to respond as she could, as she was able to. So that the role of the teacher, in my case, I wasn't her parent education, but we were friends, was to do that to be present, to be attuned with her in that moment, to provide whatever interaction she needed. And of course she could play. Maybe she couldn't grab a toy, but I was there. I could put toys in front of her and play with her. She was three. She was adorable. And I always, she inspired me so much. And I think of her every day because, and I use that when I train because it was powerful. That is so beautiful. I like want to cry because I feel like you're right. That interaction, you can like their facial expressions, right? You can see that you're having the connection. And like you said, you you could bring up toys. You can have that connection with that child, but even that child is still communicating with you. Body language, right? And that's one of the things. It's verbal or nonverbal communication that we're looking for as we go out to observe in classrooms. And I was thinking about too, Monica, as you were saying that, and definitely how touching that is, is the impact that that 
interaction or the effort that you made as an adult to interact with the child that perhaps others may have thought that there was no purpose in interacting, right? Um, and uh, how important it is for us to be aware of that. And I think that leads us to our next question, because we have received this question from, from the field in that, you know, we talked about is class reliable or applicable in a classroom where uh, we have children on IEPs? But what are the considerations for coding in a classroom where perhaps there's a large percentage of children on IEPs? So it's almost like the same philosophy, right? Things that we do consider, we want the observers to have a background in special education. We do want that, to understand what is happening in the classroom. We want the observers to talk with the teachers. Is there anything you want me to know? Observers don't have to know specificities per child. But these are things that you might see. You might see a child who is going to walk into the classroom, and if this Mickey Mouse is not on the shelf, she's going to scream because she's in the spectrum. So these conversations happening pre-observation, just to, to have that context before we observe. And then we just follow the protocol as observers. Oh, another thing is, it's not about the chronological age of the child, it's the developmental age of the child, right? That is what is, whatever they are. So we make no differences in that tool. It's the same tool we're looking for interaction. So going back to, well, maybe children are nonverbal. Teachers are. <laughs> <laughs> but teachers talking with the students, pausing, reading their responses, whatever they're using, technology or pointing or pictures, building on that so that educators still have the skills to provide these interactions. So if we have, want to have a conversation about, um, your mom told me there was a centipede in your house. Did you see it? Pause. Listen, look at the face of the child. You did see how were you scared? Pause. Have you ever seen a centipede before? You know, I think there are many kinds of centipedes. You want to learn about centipedes? Cognition. There you go. <laughs> it happens. It's not because all of the classroom has children with special needs. It doesn't mean that they don't need, they don't deserve the same opportunities of quality. They do. They do whatever they are in their development. We are not saying it's an easy thing. We are not saying that for children with special needs or not, <laughs> right? <laughs> You teachers, it's, it's not easy being a teacher. It's, and these days, it seems to be even more challenging in the emotional and social development of children and adults. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And you are doing it. When you get observed, we're looking for the same dimensions right in the evidence. And we are putting that on the correct dimensions and indicators. And we're measuring the effectiveness. And with that, then that professional development would come. What do you want to work on? What do you want to improve? And it's completely, obviously, the systems might decide, well, this is the domain we want to work on. And then you have a word, okay, so I have to work on concept development. I want to start with connection to everyday lives indicator. So thank you for, for dispelling uh, maybe some concerns that we might have in our audience that it won't measure accurately, right? Or, or it may be punitive. I think that's been a concern from some of our teachers. And of course, we're not entering into this opportunity as punitive opportunity, but more, I think, as you have said so clearly, an opportunity for celebration celebration of what's already happening in the classroom and being able to acknowledge that and to measure it in a way that can be a celebration. I appreciate that. Sure. Class is strength-based. It is. It is core of that tool. Mm -hmm. So we're not making this up. It is you are doing it. Like when I learned class, I'm like, I used to do that. I just didn't know that was the name. Now I have to <laughs> there you class. Go. So I don't know if that happened to you when you hear classes like, oh, yes, I did that. Oh, my God, I could have done that better. Like that happened to me when I learned class. <laughs> yeah, I remember the first time I took a class training. It just resonated with me. It just, to me, it made the most sense of how to assess and, and measure what's happening in a classroom, in an early childhood classroom. And and that it measured the most important things. I think that's what it was. I wasn't counting pencils and I wasn't counting crayons, but I was actually measuring what was most important. That's important. I am so with you, Terry. So <laughs> crayons, maybe there's two. What are the teachers doing with those two crayons with the children? That's what is important. Know exactly. That two. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I think we have one more question for you related to class. So how can we learn more about the research around class? 
I'm going to tell you where, but there's so much. There are more than 150 studies on class. The research, it began in, at University of Virginia, and they're still researching it, of course. And then this organization was opened in 2008 so that we could spread the word and the magic of class. But the other 30 countries studying class. So you're going to see research, and it keeps proving to be right, that interactions are changing the lives of children. So anybody who goes to any training with Teach Son will receive participant guides or manuals. And most of them will have some kind of research references. But if that specific training doesn't have it, just go to teachstone.com slash research. And then you're going to spend months reading all these papers (laughs) on the research that has been done. So if you have time, definitely check it out, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Thank you so much, Monica. What a great conversation. And can I just say before we get to our rapid fire questions, an opportunity for enriching interactions with you this afternoon and how that has uh, changed our relationship with you. Definitely, it has enriched it. So thank you. It is is my honor. Meeting you in person was beautiful. Knowing that we have this partnership is amazing. And anything that we can do, right, to build on each other's strengths and ask and help. And because of you teachers, you educators who are there listening, everything that we do is to support you so that your children have the best outcomes in their lives. Thank you for that too. And just for our listeners too, to know, we actually met Monica in person back in May conference. And so it was a lot of fun getting to meet her in person. And maybe hopefully a lot of you listeners out there right now have met Monica, or you went to maybe even her session that she had too during that time. Maybe we spoke. Some of you stood by my table and we were talking. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I think so. I bet bet you there's quite a few out there. (laughs) So now we're going to move into our rapid fire questions just to find out a little bit more about you. And so what is your favorite place to visit? It's definitely going back home to Costa Rica every time I can, of course. Costa Rica is gorgeous. That... uh, Arizona, in Arizona, there's this place called Sedona. Most of you might have heard of it. And it's such a good feeling place, other than gorgeous. So every time I go there, I feel like I cross some kind of threshold that is taking me to a different time and a different space. And it's just so peaceful and enjoyable. I'm an optimist anyway, and I'm always happy. But that place <laughs> it has such positive energy that it's my favorite. Every time I can, I go. Oh, wow. I've not been there, but I would like to go to both of your places. If you're going, let me know and I help you with both. Oh, good. Sounds good. I did get a passport, so I'm going to have to go and visit. I'm trying to travel more, so. You will love Costa Rica. Costa Rica is on my bucket list. Okay, we're going to talk. I have to plan. Sedona is closer, so you can come to Sedona sooner. That's true. (laughs) Okay, well, here's a fun one. What song do you love to play in the car while you're driving? That is fun because most of the time I'm listening to Mark Anthony. So any muse, any salsa from his albums, like I just love him so much. And um, Siri knows that. And so she puts Mark Anthony. <laughs> but the one song that I go back to and I go back is called Flor Palida. And he's so cute because he talks about this girl who was broken and he was found and then he was uh, nurtured and he blossomed and it's so beautiful and it's about love but it's so beautiful so I keep listening to it and singing it out loud in my car (laughs) is it a ballad or a cumbia it's salsa salsa okay actually I went to his concert recently in March and he said it was his favorite song I'm like oh Connection there to Mark Anthony then. Mark Connection connection is connection. That's fine. Well, we know we live in the world of technology. So here's our last question for you, Monica. What is your favorite app that you use often on your mobile device? Amazon. Amazon. Hey, I appreciate that, Monica, a lot. I'm the same way. My husband probably doesn't like it as much, but I like it. And Terry, I think, likes it too, huh, Terry? I have it on. I have that's one of my favorite apps on my device too. <laughs> so convenient. Oh my gosh. I'm not a person of going to the mall. I have never been. I learned Amazon. I'm like, where have you been all my life? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so your delivery person uh, is a frequent uh, visitor at your home, huh? Mm -hmm. Yep. 
<laughs> I actually do something that is crazy now. They can get into my garage and put the things inside and leave. <laughs> oh, there you go. So I know it's awesome. Another step up interaction with that person then, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes when they are delivering, I just open the door and we talk a little bit. And sometimes the delivery comes half out and half in that garage. I'm like, oh, no, we just put him here and I take him. And <laughs> <laughs> well, we enjoyed that. Well, thank you so much, Monica. What a pleasure it was to spend some time with you this afternoon. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Katrina. And I look forward to the next time we get together. And thank you, educators, for doing all the beautiful things that you do out there. Terry, that was such a fabulous conversation with Monica. I just learned so much around the research and that they're doing it all over the world, not just here in the U.S. That's so true, Katrina. And it, and it was a nice way to wrap up both our first part of our podcast with Aaron and then now with Monica. What I was thinking about is in our podcast with uh, Aaron, she talked about the holistic reasons why class is so beneficial in New Mexico. And then listening to Monica, as you said, the research behind that, but then also she helped us understand that class is applicable and beneficial in classrooms regardless of the composition of students and that it really is beneficial in classrooms with students on IEPs. Yes, and I think that that was just so eye-opening. Really, this is definitely where New Mexico needs to be going and I'm just so excited that we are here on this journey together with our teachers, the administrators, our stakeholders, and just all of us doing better for all the children here in New Mexico. So true, Katrina. And what a what an opportunity to be on that journey, as you said, together. Yes. Listeners, stay tuned for our next podcast.